good morning everyone uh, on behalf of ambedkar king study circle i welcome you all uh, to the speech by reshma on indian americans for prop 16 i'll give you a brief introduction about uh, reshma uh, reshma shamasundar is an independent consultant working with the non profits and plan therapy to develop and implement issue campaigns support organizational and leadership development and provide project planning and management she previously served as a vice president of program strategy at asian american advancing justice los angeles and deputy director of programs at the national immigration law center she served as executive director of california immigrant policy center that is cipc from 2003 to 2015 under her leadership cipc helped spearhead ground breaking campaigns at the state level including placing limits on cooperation between local law enforcement and the immigration authorities preserving and expanding important health and human service program for immigrant communities winning driver licenses for all californians and furthering important immigrant integration efforts she currently serves on the board of the california immigrant policy center and previously served on the boards of health access california and the south asia network in los angeles and was an inaugural fellow with the rockwood fellowship for a new california a leadership program for california's immigrant rights leaders she has received numerous awards for her leadership on immigration immigrant issues including the families usa health equity advocates of the year award and the national immigration law center courageous luminaries award she was involved in the harvard case about affirmative action on behalf of asian americans advancing justice specifically she facilitated the case by asian american students that filed in support of affirmative action she holds a dual bachelor degree from ucla and a masters in city planning from the massachusetts institute of technology mit let's give you a warm welcome uh, to reshma uh, thank you reshma over to you Thank you. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I had a, a brief opportunity to speak with um, um, Anu about your group, and um, it sounds like you all are, you know, thinking about and studying really important issues. So I'm glad to be in conversation today. Um, I'm going to share my screen, um, and uh, I understand that you, uh, you know, that you all uh, have already had a speaker. on prop um 16 so my apologies if some of this is redundant uh i just want to make sure i'm on the present view here present okay great okay so uh yeah thanks for having me so i um uh as was mentioned i'm a consultant um working on various social justice issues so i did consult for the prop 16 campaign before they were prop 16 so um a lot of my background is actually in legislative advocacy and helping um bills become law primarily at the state level but i've also done some work at the federal level and so i did support the campaign in moving um the legislation through the legislative process and then it needed to pass out of the legislature to be placed on the ballot and so um i was quite involved at that point and then since it's become a proposition i have um uh i have volunteered for the campaign so i'm speaking today in, in my capacity as a volunteer um so i think you all know what affirmative action is uh but it, you know really this is an um let me there go you know it's uh it's really a critical way um in order to ensure that everyone has equal opportunity particularly those who have faced systemic barriers to achieving success so we know you know black latinx indigenous asian american communities um we have benefited from affirmative action and you know we are one of the few states actually in the country that at this point don't allow affirmative action for kind of public contracting as well as schools so uh prop 16 is a critical way to close the chapter on prop 209 so I actually went to uh did my undergrad at UCLA right before Prop 209 passed so I graduated in 1995 um and it's 
interesting to actually hear the experiences of students who came kind of post-1996 compared to my experience. I actually was a tutor with um, what was then called the Academic Advancement Program, and we worked with um, kind of first-generation college students um, who were both freshmen and transfer students around kind of like a really well-buffeted um, tutoring program. Um, and it was focused on communities of color, on first generation students, and we talked about it pretty openly. Um, but my understanding is now that that type of um, conversation in public settings is just simply not allowed due to Prop 209. And um, I understand that uh, a lot of the, the campuses don't look anywhere nearly as diverse as they did you know, it, uh, in my day when in fact we had a really dynamic Black and Latinx population. And so, um, you know, if we were to close the chapter on Prop 209, we would allow for affirmative action. And just, I think in, in terms of brief history, and many of you already know this, is, you know, we did have a pretty ugly chapter in California history, both, you know, the um, uh, anti-immigrant ballot measures that were um, pushed forward under um, Governor Wilson in the 90s. Uh, this, this, is, this was also part of that very xenophobic and kind of anti-community of color attack. So it's really time for us in California to do away with all this ugly history and really you know, move to kind of the progressive era that California has been on for the journey that we've been on for quite some time now. Um, so uh, when Prop 16 passes in November, it will allow California to align with 41 other states that actually allow for affirmative action and you know it's critical for closing the wage gap for ensuring that there's holistic admission in the you know university process particularly the ucs and the cal states so that you know people who uh historically have been unable to access our higher education systems will um you know have an equitable chance of being able to get into those institutions um, and, you know, I think that often um, one thing that I found interesting when I started working on Prop 16 that I didn't actually know is, um, you know, I think for a lot of Asian Americans, they tend to kind of get fixated on the UC system, which I understand, you know, people have um, high school kids or, you know, kids that are going to be going to college. So that's kind of all they're focused on. Um, and I will visit that issue in a moment. Um, but I think this is actually, you know, it's a very expansive Prop 16. So it's taking a look at women and making sure that they're fairly considered. Um, right now, the way that it stands um, is, for example, if I wanted to start a K through 12 program for girls in STEM, because, you know, we say girls often are not going into STEM careers at the same kind of level as um, boys, I wouldn't be able to because that's considered affirmative action. So this has implications, you know, far beyond the college, um, you know, I think the college context that people kind of been pinning to it. Um, we make sure that businesses owned by women, by people of color, um, have equal kind of opportunity to compete for federal contracts. And then of course, in higher education, it's making sure that we have uh, diverse professionals to serve our communities. So, you know, um, I think a good example is if you look at physicians um, who are serving say Latinx or Native American communities, we know it's really a be best practice in the health, health professions to ensure that um, you know, the doctors can speak the language, have cultural competency, yet the number of Latinx and Native American physicians um, is much, much fewer than the, you know, the white and um, Asian American physicians. And that just doesn't serve our state well. And so this is really around making sure that we have diverse professionals, um, K through 12 teachers. You know, I think the, the list is pretty expansive of the type of diversity that we need to really reflect the communities that we serve in our state every day. Um, this is also about women. So we know that women, you know, make less than men, um, regardless of whether they're white, Asian American, um, you know, Latinas, uh, as you can see, actually only make 42 cents on the dollar. And so this would really, you know, both give us the opportunity to, to put programs in place at the K through 12 and college level, as we talked about. Um, and then uh, also making sure that, you know, they have access to the kinds of promotions um, that can lead their companies and organizations into the future. Um, uh, I actually think K through 12 is an area that we 
haven't talked about as much. And I don't know how many of you have kids in K through 12. Um, I have seen during my children's um, elementary school career, and even now as they get a little bit older, um, is you know they have primarily had white teachers, and um, part you know part of the reason is because we haven't necessarily been targeting resources to train teachers of color. And I think regardless of whether you know your kids are Asian American or Black or Latinx, having teachers that really reflect their experience is not only good for learning, but I think it also really allows kids to um, see themselves in the face of their educators, in the face of those who are really, you know, moving them through kind of the, their childhood processes. And so this is kind of, I think, a particularly critical goal for Prop 16. Um, and then higher education. So I think this is the one that, you know, really tends to make Asian Americans really nervous. And um, when, when I was working on the legislation, um, there were actually a number of hearings and, you know, the primary group in opposition to this and even now in opposition to prop 16 are chinese americans um and you know they um you know talked a lot about how it would take away equal opportunity from their kids um that their kids have worked hard and should be able to enter these colleges and universities you know based on their own merit and you know i i understand i myself am uh, you know, the parent of a senior who's applying to college. Um, I have a freshman in high school. So I have Indian American kids who are about to apply and go into college. The way that I look at it is that, you know, part of the goal of affirmative action and kind of holistic admissions is to ensure that you have a diverse class of individuals. So I would love for my kids to go to a UC and within that process, I would like them to be a part of an entering class that includes, um, you know, Californians and students who look like our state and, you know, are not like really narrowly um, confined to a class or race or other ethnic segment um, that, um, you know, does not allow them to have kind of a full experience. And I think it's important for all of us. Um, and I, I think the thing about holistic admissions is really race, gender, those are one consideration in the application process. Um, it's not the only consideration, but they're looking at your life experiences, they're looking at your geography, um, they're looking at where you were raised, where you're coming from. Um, and so uh, I think that um, affirmative action would just allow for us to have a more holistic admission process based on you know, who students are. Um, and then public contracting, uh, we discussed this a little bit earlier, but um, we do know that women and minority owned businesses are actually losing about $1.1 billion a year in California um, because uh, public contracts are not um, at this moment taking into consideration, um, you know, things like race and gender. And again, this would be kind of a holistic consideration of businesses. It's not simply, you know, if uh, you're a minority or woman-owned business that you get the contract, but it's one consideration within the factors of like, you know, can you do the job and, and what are the different um, strengths that your businesses bring. Um, and then, you know, employment, um, we already talked about this, but, you know, we know that women city employees, for example, are paid less than men. Um, you know, uh, we also know that they tend to be promoted. Um, at lower rates than men, uh, particularly women of color. And so in kind of a public context, this would allow that to be taken into consideration. So I did wanna talk a little bit about Asian Americans and affirmative action. So, um, you know, uh, I, I know had mentioned that um, I think many of, many, many of you are familiar with Karthik Ramakrishnan. Um, who's a good friend of mine and has been doing this kind of research for many years. And uh, they actually, if you hear him talk about it, I think, you know, he really kind of frames it in interesting ways. And they have actually lots of um, uh, polling that they've done over the years on their website, AAPI data. Um, but one of the things that we find is that Asian Americans in general tend to be 
to fall on you know the spectrum of more progressive on a range of issues and so um, they have other charts on their website that look at you know Asian American stance on things like healthcare or um, you know things like voting rights um, education etc um, but they have also done a number of um, uh, polls on affirmative action in uh, both 2016 and 2018 um, and you know, one of the things that, um, you know, Karthik always talks about actually is how um, you wouldn't think this, but Asian Indians are actually amongst the most progressive group of Asian Americans. So <clears throat> when you look at Asian American data overall as to where uh, different communities are falling, you see some communities like Vietnam Vietnamese American, for example, that, you know, don't tend to skew as progressive, even though they're majority progressive. But Indian Americans actually, as um, late as 2018, I think it'll be interesting to look at exit polls from this upcoming election, um, ha, you know, tend to view, uh, vote very democratic, um, more so heavily than almost other any other Asian American community. Um, and they tend to stand in support of, you know, all the kind of key issues that fall on a democratic slate. And, uh, including affirmative action. So if you look at this particular graph, um, you'll see that the, the little, uh, the, you know, squares kind of talk about opposition versus support. So these are just, you know, kind of what percentage is opposed to affirmative action and based on the framing. So one of the things they talk about is it matters how you talk about it. So, you know, um, uh, they mentioned the, the top blue one is, you know, in the voter survey, they mentioned affirmative action as like a bad thing. Um, uh, in you know some of the orange ones, they talk about kind of you know uh, the court case, and I'm assuming this is the the Fisher court case um, from 2016 uh, that they talk about it and oppose it, you know, as a result. So as you can see, the only community that actually um, has opposed it in any majorities are Chinese Americans. Um, at more than 60%, um, if, you know, just calling it a bad thing, and more than 50% when, you know, you talk about the, um, the actual court case, the legal decision being mentioned. Um, and then you have kind of smaller numbers of Chinese Americans actually, um, you know, kind of talking about it based on how the questions are framed. So if you go to their website, you can take a look at it, but, you know, they uh, that's why they say like how you ask the question matters and so when the question was reframed in different ways the responses were different but if you look at Asian Indians for example there's never even close to a majority opposing affirmative action and the highest amount you get is still less than a third um, well actually just over a third um, in the bottom orange one um, but you know I think in general their their polling has found that Asian Americans in general, and, and I think if you look at South Asians generally, not just the Indian population. So when you take into account, say, you know, Pakistani Americans, Bangladeshi Americans, et cetera, um, these numbers of opposition drop even further because many of those communities actually stand to benefit in, you know, really kind of um, critical ways around class and access, particularly that some Indians may not, although, you know, we've certainly seen a growing Indian undocumented population, a growing Indian low income population. Um, but uh, definitely when we look at other South Asian communities, those um, dynamics change even further. Um, and then I think to talk briefly about the Harvard case. So um, if you take a look at the picture on the left, uh, you know, this was a lot of the type of um, protesting that the Asian Americans who were opposed to affirmative action and filed the case along with Blum um, uh, um, talked about it. So, and, and even when Prop 16 was going through the legislature and, you know, if you take a look at some of their websites now, um, it's how they continue to talk about it. So there's this appropriation of civil rights language. So they use a lot of um, quotes by um, Martin Luther King, uh, you know, saying, I have a dream too. I'm an Asian American. I shouldn't be judged by the color of my skin. Um, when we know actually that MLK was in support of affirmative action, and this is actually like a really um, 
concerning way to appropriate civil rights language. And, you know, I will say that I, um, uh, I think it was mentioned in my bio, but, um, you know, my background is actually immigration. I've worked on immigration for more than two decades at this point, and affirmative action is actually something I've been doing more recently. And um, if you work on immigration in any context, then what you know is that, you know, the, the, the doors for entry into this country were closed to Asian Americans until the late 60s when we passed, um, you know, the huge immigration overhaul of the late 60s. And then um, a lot of Asian Americans actually started to come to this country in the early 70s and then beyond that um, because uh, as part of a lot of the civil rights kind of activity over the late 50s and 60s, um, it was Black activists who were really pushing for a more inclusive immigration system that didn't just um, allow, you know, kind of white wealthy people into the United States. And so a lot of Asian Americans don't understand this history, um, particularly I think the Chinese Americans that have appropriated this language. What they do is they, you know, maybe they've, they've come from, you know, their country, uh, and this is not just true of Chinese Americans, but since they're the ones who've been most a actively advocating against Prop 16, uh, but I think that we can say this is true of probably Chinese Americans, Indian Americans. It's less true of, um, you know, other communities from South Asia and Southeast Asia, but, um, you know, they may come from more kind of wealthy, privileged communities in their own country. Um, you know, they come here, they already have kind of, you know, a leg up when it comes to educational access and income. Um, they're obviously able to afford their children all the privileges of, you know, extra tutoring, SAT help, etc. And then when it comes time to uh, apply to college, um, those very parents are saying, you know, um, there's no such thing as um, privilege. Uh, affirmative action disadvantages us, we worked hard. And I think it doesn't take into account the, um, you know, the history that Black Americans have faced in this country, which is, um, you know, we're, we're newer to this country and we, even though, you know, our communities have faced tremendous amounts of racism in the last 50 years, you know, the types of histories that we see with Black Americans and the disadvantages with which um, they're starting with as well as many Latinx communities. There's kind of no equivalency. It's a very false equivalency to talk about merit. And so I think one thing that I've been deeply concerned about is, you know, Asian Americans understanding our history, understanding what white privilege means, and not we as Asian Americans not aligning ourselves with that white privilege, that we have to stand with communities of color um, in order to fight for affirmative action for the benefit of all of us. Um, I, I don't like to look at this from a self-interested perspective because I really believe it's about transformative change, but I do think it benefits Asian Americans when you know we also, um, whether it comes to businesses, whether it comes to holistic review of our college applications, that it's important um, that we be able to talk about ourselves as communities of color. And so with the Harvard case, so this is a picture from the Harvard case, but to talk briefly about that case, um, it was interesting because the Chinese American communities that were um, opposed to Harvard's kind of affirmative action policies were very vocal very much kind of utilizing this language. And I felt really fortunate to actually work with the students um, who uh, supported affirmative action. And um, you can actually go to YouTube and watch some of their stories. Um, and some of them have actually spoken out on Prop 16. Um, but it's interesting to kind of hear how much when they're applying to college, um, you can't be separated from your background. They wanted to be able to talk about, you know, their, say, Chinese American ancestry or history, Indian American history, talk about, you know, their parents' immigration story. And when you become unable to do that and when you become unable to, like, be judged within that context, the admissions committee is not kind of seeing you completely for who you are. And so that was a lot of their argument. Um, we actually kind of um, intervened in the case on behalf of those students um, with um, Advancing Justice LA. I also have uh, on my next slide, I'll show you, but um, I also uh, posted the uh, infographic that we developed as part of that case. Um, but I also just wanted to show you this slide as well, which is just, if you look at Asian American support for affirmative action um, in general, uh, oops. That. Um, can't fully see it because here we go. Um, you know, that it's it's really the Chinese Americans who are driving the 
the lack of support for affirmative action. And when you separate them out from other Asians, there actually is pretty substantial support. Um, now, again, we don't know how this translates into Prop 16 per se, because we haven't done polling on that. Um, so this is more general, and I think it will be interesting to see the election results. Um, and then finally, I think there's a few resources that, um, and uh, I hope I'll be able to share these slides with you so that you'll be able to click on it um, yourselves. But um, the Vote Yes on Prop 16 campaign has lots of great resources on their website. Um, they have support across a really broad spectrum of, you know, influencers and government and, you know, all kinds of folks um, on their website. Uh, and then uh, I did post this YouTube link to um, Hassan Minaj's um, discussion of affirmative action um, uh, on Patriot Act some years ago. Um, and it's actually, uh, and then he also has some other things specifically directed at Asian Americans, but he talks about the Harvard case in this particular clip. It's well worth watching because he specifically discusses how Asian Americans really align themselves up with, you know, against other communities of color and how that really is hurting all of us. And he really calls on Asian Americans to stand in solidarity and in support of affirmative action. And then finally, this last link is, um, it's on the, let's see if we can look at it, but there's a whole series of infographics on um, affirmative action that we did. I'm no longer in Valley Justice Alley, but when I was there um, of, you know, why uh, affirmative action is critical and why Asian Americans need to support it. So you can take a look at it, you know, um, during your own time. And then, um, you know, I think just finally, uh, why did the, you know, the proponents of Prop 16 decide to move it now because, you know, this has been 25 years in the making. And really it's, we know that the November 2020 election is really going to drive a very diverse electorate. Um, and we are seeing lots of focus in this country around racial justice right now and really having a diverse movement for change. And I think it's just really critical for us as Californians. Um, I've always said, I've been fortunate to work on lots of policies over the years that really were groundbreaking for the country when they were passed, um, but now have actually become pretty standard across a lot of blue states in the country. Um, and so California leads the way and what we do really um, shows others what's possible. Here we've been quite behind actually, but I think it's important to, to show a proactive vote for affirmative action you know, from a state that tends to set the stage for the rest of the country. Um, and you know, you can, so these are some of the core messages. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you are gonna be talking about this with your family and friends, and you can find, you know, all of this on their website. But, you know, this is really around leveling the playing field for communities of color. Um, I think we have to talk about structural racism and sexism in order for uh, people to understand what Prop 16 is. And one of the more frustrating things for me is, you know, um, I've spent a lot of time you know, I have I have three kids, and um, the youngest one is still in fifth grade. Um, but I spent a lot of time talking to them about what structural racism means, what a lot of um, you know the structures that don't allow communities of color to um, advance uh, what they look like. But I think you hear you know thing things like when people of color talk about affirmative action, then you know white people will say, well, that's reverse racism. You know, I think when you really understand what structural discrimination is, like reverse racism doesn't exist. There can be bias, but that's different. And so I think for us to be educated our um, South Asian um, and Asian American communities more generally about what structural discrimination is, what it looks like and why we need to take it apart um, is very critical. Um, and how can you support uh, Prop 16? So obviously um, you can vote for it, you can talk to your friends about it. Um, but if you go to the website, there's other ways that you can help. You can donate, you can phone bank, um, you can get involved. Um, and um, I can point you to the right folks if you are interested. Um, that's it. Thank you for supporting Equal Opportunity in California. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have.